is Quinn Meekham. I'm a professor of political science here at Brigham Young University and, and also the coordinator of the Middle Eastern Studies uh, program at BYU. Uh, we're delighted to invite you to our panel on uh, Turkey and Syria. Uh, we will have two panelists uh, addressing you today. Uh, unfortunately, Ali Arslan uh, from Istanbul University uh, is not able to join us. Uh, but we do have um, Nuri Bodur from Turkey. Uh, let me introduce him briefly. He is a senior associate in the Labor and Employment Practice Group uh, of the Essen uh, Attorney Partnership. Uh, he advises domestic and multinational clients on employment legal matters, immigration, and dispute resolution. Uh, he also advises international clients on the law on associations and foundations and represents domestic and multinational companies before all level of courts in Turkey. Uh, Nuri had a traineeship with the Istanbul Bar Association in 2006, worked with the European Court of Human Rights for a year and a half, and spent an eight-week study visit at the Secretariat of the Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights of the Council of Europe, where he worked specifically on human rights issues. And uh, he will be addressing us today on freedom of religion in Turkey, a closer look through the eyes of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, our second speaker this morning will be Nabil Fayyad, uh, coming to us from Syria. Uh, he is uh, a celebrated Syrian scholar who has studied languages, theology, pharmacy, drug manufacturing, uh, a range of things. He's written and translated numerous books and studies, uh, just a few of which include uh, Ezra Pound, the poet of the apostate, Nietzsche and Religion, Kafka, Metamorphosis, uh, Quran's Difference, uh, Mother of All Believers, Camel War, uh, Thimis, and Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, an English translation. He's been involved in many documentaries, the most important of which is the series Fasting of Peoples with the Syrian TV station Sama. Currently, he is the Syrian chief of the Academic Center for Research, and he's coming to us from the Syrian Delegation for Constitutional Reform. Uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting both of these gentlemen uh, yesterday, and uh, I believe that you'll find um, them delightful. We will save some time uh, for your questions, so please come up with uh, uh, great questions for them uh, in the second half of the panel. Uh, let me turn the time over now to Nuri, please. Thank you, Quinn. Good morning, everyone. Um, as, as Quinn said, uh, maybe before that, I should, I should uh, start by thanking uh, the Brigham Young University and everyone who participated, who took part in the organization of this beautiful symposium. This gives us a beautiful chance of uh, exchanging ideas and trying to understand what's going on in each other's country. Uh, as Quinn said, I, I uh, work in a law firm. I'm a legal practitioner. Uh, I represent uh, clients uh, mainly uh, in the employment law practice, this is one of the main things that I do. The second part is I represent mainly Christian uh, clients in Turkey in their, um, uh, both vis-a-vis -vis the government and uh, the, the courts. So uh, when I uh, looked at this issue, the, the symposium, the, the topic here, I thought that maybe combining my experience in Turkey, the current experience that I get, with my experience in the European Court of Human Rights, would be a good idea. Uh, so uh, my presentation, as you can see it uh, in the screen, uh, will be uh, a closer look to the freedom of religion in Turkey through the eyes of the European Court of Human Rights and Article 9 specifically, and um, in the applications brought against uh, Turkey. Uh, I recognize the fact that there are other issues that fall under the different other different articles of the European Convention on Human Rights. But because of the time uh, I was led to speak today, I actually didn't include them in this presentation, but we can always discuss them uh, in the Q&A session. So to start with, uh, Turkey, the Republic of Turkey, became a party to the European Convention on Human Rights in 1954. Then Turkey recognized the individual, uh, uh, the application individual application, the right to individual application in 1987. And three years after that, Turkey also recognized the uh, jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, in, the, uh, in the first slide, we can just see an analysis of the statistics just from last year. This is the latest analysis. And you can see the, the shares of the, the countries that 
against which the applications are filed in the court. You can see Turkey, it represents 13.6% of the, the entire applications filed last year. So it is, in this respect, the fourth uh, country, uh, Ukraine, Italy, Russia, and then Turkey. And this is an, an interesting uh, data because up until 2012, Turkey, uh, it was receiving a lot of applications and many decisions were given uh, in relation to Turkey, against Turkey. But in 2012, we had the right to individual application with the Turkish Constitutional Court as an additional instance before the European Court of Human Rights. So you can see its uh, impact, especially last year, in relation to the applications declared inadmissible or struck out, applications in which judgments delivered uh, 115 at the very uh, right. Uh, this is because there was an additional remedy instance in domestic law, so the, uh, the remedy could be found there before going to the European Court of Human Rights at the international level. This is again uh, another interesting uh, data. It covers between 1959 to 2014 until last year and it refers to each article. I am uh, not sure and optimistic that everyone can see uh, the, the, the figures there, but Turkey, it is, it is the, the third. It's actually here, and Article 9 is here that we will be mentioning today. So since 1954, actually since Turkey recognized the, the court's jurisdiction, there have been nine judgments where the court ruled that Turkey violated Article 9 of the Convention. And, and five of these decisions are about the conscientious objectors, and the rest are various uh, other parts of, the, uh, uh, of Article 9. So Article 9 is this. It is, it is two paragraphs. The, the first paragraph starts with recognizing the absolute nature of the right. It says, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. <coughs> this right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, change, and uh, freedom either alone or in community with others, and in private or public, to manifest his religion, this is the second item, or belief in worship, teaching, practice, and observance. <coughs> That the first paragraph refers to the absolute nature of this uh, right, which neither the state nor anybody else can interfere. This is, the, this is uh, often referred to as the uh, forum internum. This is the internal space of everyone. Then uh, paragraph two comes into play. Uh, this is uh, about the exception to the first paragraph, to the right recognized in the first paragraph. It says, freedom to manifest. In the first paragraph, we talked about freedom to change and, and freedom to manifest. But the second paragraph only refers to how the freedom to manifest could be restricted. Freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs shall be subject, to, subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society in the interests of public safety, for the protection of public order, health or morals, or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. So these are the, the elements that the state authorities can rely on, can use, in order to restrict the right recognized in the first paragraph of Article 9. It is not as simple as that, and in practice, uh, huge discussions are going on, of course. And the, the reflection of this right, Article 9, uh, the right to uh, freedom, thought, conscience, and freedom, uh, religion, is, is uh, taking place under Article 24 of the uh, Constitution, as you can see in this slide. You will notice that the first three paragraphs, they are more or less the same uh, as the first paragraph of Article 9. So recognizing the similar rights there. The fourth and the fifth paragraphs, they regulate religious and moral education and the, the obligation that no one shall be allowed to exploit or abuse religion, the, the feel, religious feelings, etc. 
the fourth paragraph is actually covered by Article 2 of the first protocol to the convention. But Turkish constitution just put this together because uh, it, it preferred to regulate it under uh, this paragraph because it reg regulates religious education. Well, my um, aim here is to make sure that everybody after this session, leaving this room, has at least a bit of an idea what Turkey's issues before the European Court of Human Rights are. So just maybe you will be uh, having the titles of the issues, which will be uh, making me happy. Uh, so I will go through each issue and refer to the European Court of Human Rights case law about it. Helen, can you please let me know if your uh, ID, any of your IDs, bears information about your religion? No, you don't need to show it to me. <laughs> I don't think they do. You don't think? Okay. Mine does. My ID in Turkey, it does. Uh, it, is, it is written religion, Islam, for me, and it is required that I submit my ID to the government authorities, to the police, at the airport, when I go to the banks, etc. So it actually refers to my manifestation of my religion whenever somebody else asks me to show them my ID. You don't have it? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I was not bothered about this, but apparently Sinan Ushik was, as you can see in the first slide. This is a, an application filed by an, a, a citizen of the Republic of Turkey, an Alevi citizen, which is a, a branch of Islam, which has around 20 million uh, uh, believers in Turkey, followers in Turkey. It has differences with the Sunni uh, interpretation of Islam, which we will come to in a, in a, uh, in a couple of minutes. And, and he asked the, the national authorities to change this, because in his ID it was written, his religion was indicated as Islam. He said, change it to Alevi. He was denied this uh, request. Then he filed a lawsuit. He lost before the uh, 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 domestic courts. The domestic courts, when faced with such an application, they refer the topic to the religious uh, presidency of, the, of religious affairs, which is linked to the prime ministry. And the response from the uh, uh, presidency of religious affairs was, Alevism is not a separate standalone religion, so it could not be indicated in the people's IDs. So this is why the applicant was refused this right. Then he took the case before the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights looked at the issue and said, <coughs> Alevism is a belief which must be protected under Article 9 of the Convention. And it is not for the states to draw the borders of what is a separate religion and what is not. And this was one of the items that it, it put the, the judgment on. The second uh, pillar was the mere fact that there is a religion box identifying each individual, individual's religion is enough to amount to a violation of the convention because it is about the right to manifest your religion. And when the police asks you in the street for your ID, automatically you, you, you are asked to manifest your religion. And in 2006, there was a a uh, change in our legislation, which uh, provided for the uh, people who desire to ask the uh, civil registration authorities to leave, to delete the religion, uh, Islam, uh, or whatever is written there, empty, leave it blank. But even for that, you need to disclose that you don't believe in what was written there. So this was, again, a manifestation of your religion. So the court recommended to Turkey that it could remove from its uh, legislation, Civil Registration Act, the obligation to ink that the IDs include a religion uh, box. So this is, this is not done, but this is where the, the ECHR case law is at the moment. The, the second part uh, is about a decision, uh, uh, again, the same request from a Jehovah's Witness. He was denied the right to change his 
uh, religion in, this, uh, in the uh, religion box. And the, the, another similar conclusion for a Baha'i citizen, they were denied this uh, right in Turkey. Alevism, we, we, we talked about it just a moment or two ago. It is um, the Alevi population in Turkey, the people say it is around 20 million. Some say it is about 25 million. They interpreted uh, uh, Islam differently, different than uh, uh, the Sunni way of interpretation. They don't go to mosques. They go to gem evis. Gem mean, means gathering. So they gather in gem evis and they, they sing. They don't pray namaz like the uh, Sunni majority does. Uh, they don't believe that going to uh, hajj, pilgrimism, is necessary. They don't interpret it that way. And uh, they have gem evi, houses of gem, they are places of worship, which are not recognized by the government. Because if a uh, worship, place of worship is recognized by the government, then it enjoys some taxation benefits, utility benefits, electricity, water, etc. But if, it, if this is not a, a, a place of worship recognized by the government, then these benefits are not granted. In this case, Cumhuriyetçi Eğitim ve Kültür Merkezi Vakfı, this is a foundation that runs Cemevis all around Turkey, uh, they asked for an exemption uh, from paying the uh, uh, electricity bills. This was refused because the authorities said, you are not a separate religion, you are not recognized. Uh, because if you are recognized, as shown in the uh, presentation, the, the, these bills, electricity bills, for example, they are uh, paid by a fund from a fund administered by the Directorate of Religious Affairs. So they, after failure with, before the domestic authorities, they put the case before the ECHR, before the European Convention on Human Rights. There was a violation of Article 14, uh, prohibition of discrimination, in conjunction with Article 9 of the Convention, because the ECHR said, you don't have any justifiable grounds to treat the places of worship of Alevis uh, according to uh, the, the facts of the case. So you need to grant them this status so that they can enjoy the benefits that you recognize to other religions in your national legislation. Uh, a similar case, Doğan and others versus Turkey, is now pending before the uh, Grand Chamber of the Court. It is filed in 2010. It is a, a request made by 203 Alevi citizens of the Republic of Turkey. Uh, it is now pending, so we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but it is, it is uh, in the Turkish High Court, the, the Supreme Court of Appeals, uh, ruled in, in, on the 28th of May this year that the places of worship of Alevis should be given, uh, recognized as a place of worship. So I don't know what the impact of this national decision will be on the Doğan and others versus Turkey case. This is now pending. But this is a very positive uh, uh, improvement because the national court, the high court in Turkey, adopted the, uh, the, the facts and findings of the European Court of Human Rights in the Cumhuriyetçi Eğitim ve Kültür Merkezi lawsuit. So it came to the same conclusion as the uh, ECHR did. Wearing of headscarves at school, this is another issue. We, we, we actually had, I need to use past tense there, because uh, as the, the current status of legislation in Turkey is uh, <coughs> students can go to schools uh, with headscarves. It is, it is a little bit, uh, it is resolved for the moment. And in public service, public servants can wear the headscarf. But still, this was a, a, an issue discussed by the European Court of Human Rights in Leyla Shahin versus Turkey. This is a grand chamber judgment again. Uh, th in this case, the applicant was a, a student at the, at the medicine faculty. Uh, she was wearing the headscarf when she was coming to class. And at the time, uh, this was not allowed by the legislation. Oh, really? OK. And the, the, the court looked into the uh, case law uh, saying that this uh, wearing of the headscarf, relying on a, constitution, a, court, a constitutional court decision by the Turkish uh, state, saying it is for the national authorities to decide if this is necessary or not. 
So it said there is no violation. So it is up to the national states because I, as the international judge, am not better placed than a national authority to rule, to pass judgment on that. Uh, the Turkish Constitutional Court decisions on religious clothes, two uh, recent judgments where the court adopted the ECHR principles and uh, ruled on, on violations uh, for two people uh, in Turkey. Uh, this is a positive uh, uh, development because this is after uh, the constitutional changes in 2010 and the right to individual application was recognized. This is a, still a domestic remedy now. Uh, conscientious objection. This is, this is a, still a structural issue going on in Turkey. We, we had uh, five lawsuits where violations were found by the European Court. Because of the lack of uh, the, the option for conscientious objectors to do community service and that they need to go to the army without any other option, the, the European Court of Human Rights says this is not a, a, uh, the, the, the proper way of handling this and it is uh, the, the situation is still the same under the national legislation. Missionary activities, there is no ECHR case law on that, but this was a decision by the Turkish High Court where the Turkish High Court referred to Kokinakis versus Greece. This is a decision of the European Court and said the propaganda, religious propaganda, is a part of uh, Article 9 of the Convention. It's a safeguard there and the national authorities don't have the luxury to restrict it if there is no uh, plausible explanation to that. This is uh, positive, and thank you for your patience and attention. I look forward to the discussion in the Q&A session. Good morning, or good, uh, good evening, because I've come from a town that's controlled by Daesh, by ISIS, so good evening according to ISIS time. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, dear ladies and gentlemen, when one, com when one comes from a, s a country like Syria where civilians are settling are suffering from a war that has been going on for more than four years. He feels that, that it's impos impossible for him, especially as a researcher, to devote his energy and his intellectual zeals to talk about anything beside the Syrian crisis that is severely threatening the very existence of his country, its culture, and its people. However, the current crisis in Syria has its rules in the religious traditions of the country, mainly the Islamic theology. The most important aspect of the conflict in Syria today is the confrontation between the uh, tradition and modernity, between the 7th century Arabia and the 21st century Syria. The war has become a manifestation of an old age conflict between two ideas. The uh, Heracle an idea that advancement is inevitable, that one cannot step twice into the same river for other water are uh, continuously flowing in on the one hand and Parmenid's monism and its view that change is merely an illusion on the other. The latter tendency is represented by Islamists who want to bring to drag Syria back to the seventh century and keep it there forever after. As a neutral observer and as someone has, who has spent most of his time, his life in Syria, I can say confidently that what is happening now is, just, is not just a military confrontation between uh, confrontation. Indeed, it is an represented trage tragedy that had made the entire world morally bankrupt and completely unable to deal with such a calamity. A crisis of refugees, for example, is much more complex th uh, than what people may think, for there is something that is being totally ignored by the media, I mean religion. 
According to the best of my knowledge, there is a cultural battle lurking beneath the sound of guns, aircraft, and uh, car bombs. Religion, tradition, and a rigid view of Islam all factor into this struggle and turn it into a confrontation between an ideology of the 7th century Arabia on, one hand, on the one hand and a modernist theology that aspires to create a politically diverse Syria on the other. To further contextualize my views, I would rather refer to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's well known uh, internationally that this declaration is a historic turning point in the history of human, humanity because it's an emphasis on the importance of human dignity and the affirmation that human life is always more valuable than an ideology, whatever that ideology may be. But the truth is most Arab countries did not comply with this declaration for religious reason, of course. I rightly believe that Islam, at least its orthodoxy, radically contradicts some of the core tenets of the Universal, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. While reading the authoritative Islamic sources, one cannot help but to conclude that Islam is at least partly incompa incompatible with our views on human rights. Articles are substantially contradict Islamic law, Sharia, I mean, are Article 2, everyone is entitled to, uh, to all rights and the freedoms without distinction of any kind. Article 16, 16 1, Article 16, 1, men and, wo and women of uh, full age without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry and to found a family. Article 18, everyone, and this is very important, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. The right include, includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and the freedom either alone or com in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion, his religion or her religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Thus, let me shed in this shortcut approach a little bit of light on the main sources for this current clash between Islam and the human rights, and then discuss some of the intellectual obstacles that prevent Islam from entering the 21st century. By doing so, I hope to be able to explain how some organizations that adhere a uh, literalist view of Islam can undermine international peace and security and destroy ancient cultures, as what happened yesterday in Palmyra. There is no doubt that Quran itself does not contain, does not contain the slightest claim that it is valid for every time and every place. But the fact that Muslim scholars, for, for one reason or another, take some verses from the Quran and consider them without any convincing logical argument and evidence that Islam, most sacred text, is limitlessly valid then, now, and forever. The first verse, the, the first verse uh, they usually cite says, this day, this is the only, I mean, the main source for the claim that Quran, I mean, Islam is, I mean, Quran is valid for every time and place. This day, have I perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have, cho and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. 5-3, uh, Al-Ma'idah, in the Quran it's Al-Ma'idah, called Al-Ma'idah. 
Here I will use three highly regarded Orthodox Muslim interpreters to understand this verse. First of all, Tafsir At-Tabari. At-Tabari says, and the evidence that what you needed from your religion, I completed all to you, so do not increase it after this day. Contrary to some of what is mentioned above, the court to be says, many verses, many verses and laws of the Quran has come down after that verse. And among them, one about usury and another about kalala. Kalala, you know, it's a very Arabic word means the man who died without, one who dies without a parent or a child. This is the, the tafsir of Al Qurtubi. As for Ibn Kathir, he has an interpretation that is more in line with Al Tabari. The Almighty, this is my translation to the, to the, uh, to the uh, text, the Almighty completed for them the religion. So they do not need other religion nor a prophet than their, uh, their prophet prayers be upon him. So God make him the seal of the prophets and send him to the mankind and to the jinn. You know what the meaning of the jinn? Yes. So uh, no lawful, but his no forbidden, but his no religion except what he prescribed. And everything tells is right and the truth. This is the tafsir of Al Ibn Kathir to this verse. Muslim scholars have been using another of two verses to perpetuate the notion that teachings of the Quran are timeless and not res uh, restricted to a specific place. One of the verses attests to the idea that the Quran is a complete guide for the believers by saying that nothing have we omitted from the book. 638. This verse has three similar interpretations. First, the first is interrupted by Ibn Kathir as that nothing was left unwritten in the mother of the book. He means, the, uh, I mean the, uh, the Quran. This is Ibn Kathir. Second, Al-Tabari echoes the previous statement by saying that we meaning uh, he, we, meaning Allah, did not overlook anything in the book. There is nothing that is not in the book. Third, another confirmation of the previous, of the previous view comes from al qurtubi who argues that in the Quran, nothing of the religion is left without being referenced. In short, Muslim scholars have been following such an approach to systematically keep the myth that the Quran uh, altogether is for every time and place alive. To expound on the difficulties and inflexible view uh, 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 of difficulties or such, such an flexible view generates, I will point out some contradictions between the Quran and the, uh, the uh, UN Human Rights Charter. Demonizing the other in Islam. In Islam, there are two kinds of other. People, the people of the scripture, I mean Christian and Jews, and the other people who are, who are neither Muslims nor the people of the scriptures. For the people of the scripture, the Quran says, fight those who believe not in Allah nor in the last day nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book until, and this is very important, they pay the tribute with, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. This is 920. Nine. The people of the scripture, as a term, explicitly means the Jews and the Christians. However, we can add them Sabines. 
Sabians in Arabic, Sabia or Mindaiyin, the people who, show, who uh, I mean, I have uh, already a documentary on the internet about Sabia. And uh, they worship uh, planets and you know, they are already in, in Iraq, in Iraq, Abadan, Baghdad and Damascus. Uh, this group have three options. I mean, Christian, Jews, and Sabians. Either to fight the Muslim to death, or to convert to Islam, or to pay the tribute with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. The second kind of the other in Islam presumably includes anyone who is neither a Muslim nor belong to the people of the scriptures. This is particularly uh, the worst of the humankind. These people have two terrible choices. Since that they cannot pay the tribute with willing submission and feel themselves as subdued, they have either convert to Islam or to fight the invading Muslims to death. The second problem or second issue in Islam is slavery. Uh, Expectedly, uh, Islam wo uh, was in harmony with the spirit of the age in which it was produced. The Quran does not prohibit slavery. Yet, at the same time, it's, it's ironically uh, forbids some of then common practices which is far less threatening to humanity than slavery such as uh, and, uh, intoxicants and gambling, dedication to stones, uh, of stones and divination by arrows. Quran 5.19. To be fair, one must acknowledge that Muhammad, however, did encourage freeing slaves as part of redeeming one's sins. In several vers verses of the Quran, we read about freeing a slave uh, and as Expiation for sins. Uh, the first verse is, never should a believer kill a believer, but if it so happens by mistake, compensation is due if one so kills a believer, it's ordained that he should free a believing slave. The second verse, Allah will not call you to account for what is uh, futile in, in your oaths, but he will call you to account for your deliberate, uh, deliberate oaths for expiation. Feed 10 indigent persons on a scale of the average for uh, the food of your families, or, or close them, or give a slave his freedom. Verse 5:85. By those who divorce their wives by zihar, zihar from zahar, zahar uh, I mean back, to give her his back. Such a one should free a slave before they touch each other. Uh, 58 1. By the slave for sin strategy, the apparent practice of slavery is not completely banned in Islam. Concubinage. Concubinage as a subproduct as a subproduct of slavery is an issue that recognized by Islam every day as leg uh, legitimate. There are many references to concubinage, concub concubinage in, in the Quran. If you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with the orphans, marry women of your choice, two or three or four. But if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with them, then only one or a captive, a captive that your right hands possess. Uh, Okay, uh, four three also four twenty four, uh, twenty five thirty six. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it must be noted that 
without his hesitation that some of Prophet Muhammad's behaviors and attitudes are completely in contradiction with those of the Islamic scholars that came much later after him and famously hampered an attempt to modernize Islam and controlize the sum of the con uh, controversial Quranic verses. Regardless of the vary the varying positions of some of his early successors, the ultimate validity of the Quran, some important Quran provision uh, were suspended shortly after Muhammad's death according to the needs of the then newly establ established Muslim state. The flexibility which, which, with, with which Muhammad dealt with the uh, mundane issues of his time is quite apparent in the story of Islamic prohibition of the wine. In the beginning, it was considered that wine gives sustenance. And for the fruit of the date palm and wine, you get out wholesome and drink and food. 1665. In another verse, in another verse, however, we read a different view. They ask thee concerning why and gambling say, in them is a great sin and some profit. Uh, profit for men, but the sin is greater than the profit. 2.16. Uh, a third verse seems to be to frown upon a wine is it views as determinal uh, uh, to one's communication with uh, the divine. You, oh you who, ha who have believed, do not approach a prior while you are intoxicated uh, until you know what you are saying. Then at last, one of the lat latest surahs of the Quran forbid wine altogether and deems uh, it as evil. You who believe in intoxicants and gambling, deductions of stones and divination uh, by ours are uh, ab uh, ab uh, abomination of Satan handiwork. Issue such abomination, 590. Far, far, uh, uh, furthermore, in his seminal uh, book, The Text and Ijihad, Abdul Hussein Sharaf al-Din, the notable Shia thinker, details a myriad of ijtihads of the senior companions of the Prophet, which are contrary to the Quran. Some of them, among many, are related to Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph of Muhammad. The Sirah biography of Muhammad tells us that the Prophet was paying to people whose faith was weak in order to maintain their Islam. And this, their, their, reality, their loyalty would be uh, guaranteed. This behavior was supported by some of, of uh, some Quranic texts, including alms are for the poor and the needy, and those employed to administer the funds for those whose hearts have been recently reconciled to the truth for those in bondage and in debt. 960. With the arrival of, of Umar ibn al-Khattab to power, he abolished the rule regarding those whose hearts have been recently reconciled to the truth. Omar justified his actions by claiming that the Prophet had to pay new uh, converts because Islam was still weak and uh, in need to, of loyalty. But during his, his, uh, his reign, Omar believed, his rule, Omar believed that Islam has already been established and strong. Therefore, he saw no need for such a rule. In addition to that, uh, Islamic literature tells us how Omar ibn Khattab banned temporary marriage, marriage that is temporary and without witness, witnesses. The kind of marriage, according this kind of marriage, according to Islamic tafsirs, was uh, permissible uh, at the time of the Prophet. So, the, the verse says, so for whatever you enjoy from them, you give, uh, give them their due compensation as an obligation. 424. Islamic sources make, make three, make clear that when Omar ibn al-Khattab found that the matter had exceeded the limit of satisfying sexual needs to become a legal 
God sanctioned prostitution. He abolished the practice altogether, disregarding the fact that it was, and still technically is today, uh, a permissible practice according to the Quran. Okay. Okay, just one minute. My conclusions. There is not even the slightest reference to the Quran validity for every time and the place in the Quran itself. And all what has been said on the issue by both moderate or and extreme groups for a, uh, realistic pers uh, from a realistic perspective is just an invention of Islamic scholars that came much later after than Muhammad. The critical, the, the critical crisis that is plaguing, uh, plaguing Islam today is the desire of Islamists to imprison Islam in a jail of timelessness. It is such a way of thinking that has brought us today face to face with the likes of the Islamic State, ISIS, a terrorist group which threatens not only the, the international peace and security, but also the age-long thriving civilizations of country like Syria and Iraq. The solution to the global crisis that has resulted from the rise of Islamic State in Syria, in Iraq and Syria requires for the first, uh, first and foremost, the rehabilitation of the entire Islamic culture that product, that produce the like of the fighters of ISIS. The rehabilitation cannot be done only by only utilizing the effort of Arab secularists, modern is Muslims and Westerns who are interested in doing uh, humanity a favor by combating radical Islam. In order to achieve any tangible results in, the, in this regard, we need an, uh, an urgent reformation of the public Islamic institutions that claim to be moderate while in reality keep, they keep on perpetuating the, the uh, scarredness, uh, sar, sar, holiness of certain Islamic texts and doctrines that constitute the ideological backbone of, S of, of, of almost all terrorist groups from Al-Qaeda to ISIS and Boko Haram. Finally, in ironic twist of faith, I found myself today here in front of you talking about the multinational the multinational group, uh, Islamic group, uh, terrorist group, whose members do not drink wine, yet they behead people, uh, they destroy churches and ancient ruins, rape little children, and kidnap women to use them uh, as sex slaves. Wine is not drunk by those fanatics because they, the ban on wine in Islam is crystal, is a, a crystal clear. However, till today, most Muslim scholar, scholars do not at all discredit the passages that make it permissible for the fanatics to behead, loot, rape, and destroy. These passages have always been there and still considered sacred until they are rejected by mainstream Islamic institutions that have the influence to make a real change but are willing to. There is a good chance that the plight of our Yazidi brothers and sisters will be the plight of every life-loving man and woman who lives in the 21st century and has no intentions to return to the dark age. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much both uh, to Nuri and to Nabil uh, for being here. Um, Nabil came to us uh, from Damascus, which is uh, a difficult journey, and, and we're very grateful that uh, you were able to join us. We have only a couple of minutes um, b before our, our time ends. Uh, what I'd like to do is maybe just take one or two questions from the audience and then invite you to respond to whatever you hear in maybe 90 seconds each. Okay, so you can, you'll have to pick and choose. Uh, what you would prefer. I, I'd like to just kick it off with two two very brief questions. Uh, first, to Nuri, I'm wondering if, if you could tell us just a little bit about uh, the direction you think religious freedom is evolving in Turkey, 
and uh, also uh, what you think the, the key next steps in Turkey are for increased religious freedom. Uh, and uh, to Nubil, as, as well to you, uh, I think you, you made uh, you know, a rich case for uh, some of the challenges that your country is facing in its interpretation of Islamic doctrine. Uh, there are many people, uh, as you well know, who are uh, going to Turkey to join the Islamic State, uh, many people who are finding, in some ways, refuge within that doctrine, within that form of organization. Tens of thousands of people from around the world have gone uh, to support them. And, and I'm wondering if you have any theories as to the attraction uh, and why people are, are, are supporting an organization um, that you discredit. Uh, and as, as well, if, if some of the concerns that you mentioned about human rights in particular uh, are concerns that uh, other people are actually finding the Islamic State are you know, actually supporting human rights in ways that appeal to them. Uh, let me just open it up if there are other questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm David Little. I had a question to the uh, Turkish uh, individual. Um, uh, do the Alevis uniformly think of themselves as a religious group uh, independent of Islam. I have read recently that there's at least some division of opinion within the Alevi group as to whether they consider themselves an independent or uh, different religion and, would, and whether they actually would be satisfied with being categorized as a religious minority. Could you clarify that? Uh, uncertainty in my mind. Thanks. I have a question also uh, directed to uh, Mr. Bodur. Um, you've talked to us about uh, the various cases in the European Court of Human Rights involving Turkey. C could you address very briefly uh, how Turkey is, has implemented, responded to the decisions of the court. Um, my, my question is to Mr. Fayad. Um, I was just interested in the numbers of people, uh, the, no, the number of Muslims in the world and what percentage of that number is extremist. And uh, what can be done or what can people around the world do um, to help, uh, help in the, in the areas that you're looking for help in? Okay, thank you. I think uh, our time starts now. So, Nuri, 90 seconds. Come on up. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Quinn, to start with yours, directions in the religion of uh, freedom of religion, uh, which direction it's evolving. Uh, when I uh, m remember the, while well, it's still here, uh, this, this presentation, this is by the Turkish Constitutional Court. I am optimistic that the Turkish courts, rather than the European court, is now taking the initiative in promoting and developing the fr freedom of religion in Turkey. Because what the Constitutional Court does is apply the principles adopted by the ECHR and the same mechanism. Was there a right recognized? Was there an interfer interference with that right? Was there interference uh, uh, for a legitimate aim? Was it prescribed by law? And lastly, was it necessary in a democratic society? So the Turkish Constitutional Court is, is using the same systematic in addressing the issues. And I am uh, optimistic that it is evolving in a positive direction. Uh, next steps, I believe it is crucial that the decisions of the Turkish Constitutional Court are also recognized uh, by the lower courts, the courts of lower instances, because otherwise it's not going to be tangible for the citizen in the street. Uh, for the question raised by uh, uh, Mr. David Little, right? Um, I think there is a, a little bit of a dis uh, discussion among the, the Alevis themselves, but I believe the dominant uh, uh, view is that they are not a a separate religion, but they are just a branch of Islam. They follow Prophet Muhammad, and then they believe in the leadership of Prophet Ali, because Alevism means the, the followers of Ali. 
And uh, I don't believe that it is a separate religion, but it is a, just a different interpretation of Islam in terms of praying, pilgrimage, etc. And the, the last question that you raised. Can I just ask, uh, do they, would they be satisfied with the category oh, of yeah. religious minority? Is that important uniformly to the audience? Uh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> Yes, because this, this has been their struggle for many years in Turkey now, and we are talking about a group of approximately 20 million people here. Um, I forgot the second part, thank you. Uh, the, the, the last question that you raised, sir, implementation of the CHR decisions. Uh, the, the issues that I listed, some of them, religion boxes on IDs, this is not remedied fully. Uh, conscientious objection, it is not remedied. Uh, fully. Uh, the, the headscarf issue is remedied. Uh, the, the, um, but other than that, I believe that Turkey is it's doing its best because when we, we are talking about law here, but the surrounding conditions in Turkey are a little bit uh, different and impacting the implementation, the full implementation of the decisions of the court. So uh, it is doing its best, at least this is what I can tell you. In, in the context of a democratic country where 99% of the population belongs to one religion and the politicians need to get elected. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, I think. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, I wish to add something to my friend Nuri, okay, about the Alawites, because um, some of my relatives are Alawites, and I, 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 um, you know, I had many articles about their faith, about their history, about everything. So Alawites in Syria are three categories. They are not the same. First is Klazi, th second is Mahusi, third is Murshidi. All of them are not Muslims. They do believe in Trinity. I mean, they believe in three sacred people who are Muhammad, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Salman al-Farisi. They have no mosques. They don't fast Ramadan. And they have some very special ways of worshiping. And uh, um, they, they consider themselves today in Syria, they don't say they are, that they, we are Muslims. They say we are Alawite. The, the old name of Alawite is Nusayriyun, Nusayri. And the old name of the Christian is Nasara. And the old capital of the Nasara, the Nasara and Nazarenes have had two capitals, one in the mountains of the Alawites which is uh, uh, um, one in, in, in Jordan, which is, uh, which is Pella, other in, in the mountains of the Alawite. So I think there is, I have a book out about Al-Nasara, and I think there is a good or a, 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 a relationship between Al-Nasara and Al-Nusayriyin. Al-Nasara, the Nazarenes, and nusayriyin Al-Alawiyyun, the Alawites. So, um, according to my experience, according to my research, according to my, to my readings, Alawites are not Muslims. Yes, yes. The, the Moshidis among Alawites, they do believe in someone who has a god. His name is Salman al-Murshid. They, they are about half a million in Syria. They don't pray. They have, I mean, they don't pray according to Muslim uh, traditions. But they have some very special uh, traditions. They, they don't, the Alawites have the same uh, uh, Eid as Muslim. For example, Eid al-Fatr, Eid al-Adha. Yes, I'm sorry. But Moshidis have no Eid as Alawites. Sorry? OK. Yes, sorry. Uh, the number of According to Al Jazeera TV, I think um, uh, uh, before maybe three weeks, uh, uh, they asked it in Al Jazeera TV, what is the percentage 
uh, of people who support ISIS in the Gulf? The answer was 83%. And there was another question in Al Hayat magazine in Saudi Arabia about the same thing in, in, in uh, last March. And the answer was the, uh, the, the, uh, the people who support ISIS in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf is about 82%. Yes. Yes, it's very it's very complicated, you know, question. It's not. I we, we, we actually yes. we may, may not have many, time, but we encourage you to come down and, and maybe have that conversation yes. during our break. So um, thank you very much to both of our panelists. Please give them a round of applause.